Now we're going to talk about PCA again. So I introduced PCA in earlier lectures, um, but now we'll talk about it specifically in the context of looking at genetic data. So to get an intuitive feel for how principal components analysis or PCA works, I would recommend watching one of these uh, videos. Uh, you can watch the first video if you're short on time. And so the first video is just a kind of five minute quick and dirty uh, intuition of what the outputs of PCA mean. The second video is a slightly longer 20 minute video that gives an actual detailed explanation of what PCA calculates and how the output kind of relates to the input. And the nice thing about this video is that it is explained in the uh, context of doing an analysis of gene expression data. And so it is kind of more geared towards uh, genomics. So PCA is formally what you could call a dimensionality reduction method, uh, which in the current context, we are going to use both for visualizing your data as well as for uh, estimating some covariates they can use to correct for things like ethnicity. So the idea of PCA is that, you know, you start out, your data starts out fairly high dimensional. And by high dimensional, I mean that, you know, these genotyping assays that you use nowadays can assay up to like say 10 million SNPs per individual. And so each individual is basically described by a set of 10 million different SNPs. And so if you want to visualize, and by visualize, I mean just draw a scatter plot of uh, individuals where the axes correspond to SNPs and the points correspond to individuals, it's really hard because if you're, if each individual is described by 10 million SNPs, um, it's not really possible to draw a 10 million dimensional scatter plot on a piece of paper. And so the idea of PC is that somehow it takes these high dimensional measurements of individuals and it somehow creates these um, kind of pseudo SNPs or what you might call meta SNPs, uh, which they represent as these axes PC1 and PC2 in this figure here. Um, and the idea is that variation among these principal components, PC1 and PC2, tries to capture variation between individuals in your original 10 million dimensional uh, SNP space. And so each PC axis in the principal components plot corresponds to a set of correlated SNPs. And again, the idea is that variation in PC1, for example, corresponds to variation in these correlated SNPs across individuals. And so the difference between, for example, PC1 and PC2 is that PC1 corresponds to a set of SNPs that collectively explain most of the variation in genetics between individuals. So they correspond to the SNPs that vary the most between individuals. And then PC2 is basically the second, is basically a different set of SNPs uh, that explain basically the second most amount of variation in genetics between individuals. And so again, here PCA is a, is a method for mapping, taking as input your genetic similarity matrix that we saw on the previous slide, and basically spitting out a set of coordinates where each individual is described by uh, coordinates and the coordinates correspond to a value in PC1, PC2, and so on and so on. And so the reason why PC is so useful is it does two things. Number one of which is that uh, if you want it to, it can, it can basically just give you a set of 2D coordinates for each individual. So it'll just give you coordinates for PC1 and PC2 for each individual. And that lets you draw a scatter plot of your individuals. The nice thing about this scatter plot is that because uh, PC is these kind of reduced dimensions are calculated in a way such that variation in these 2D scatter plots tries to capture the same variation that you see in the original 10 million dimensional SNP space. That means that two individuals that are close in genotype uh, across the 10 million SNPs will also look close in this PC space. And so this kind of reduced dimensionality space gives you a visualization that tries to be as accurate as possible with respect to the original data. The second thing it does is that these coordinates can actually be used as covariates or variables in your uh, line fitting models. And so suppose that, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, but suppose that somehow principal components one corresponded to uh, ethnicity of 
your individual. Um, so suppose that, for example, you had you were lucky and your uh, your cohort corresponded to individuals that were either 100% uh, European Caucasians, 100% uh, East Asians, or some mixture of Europeans and Asians. Then suppose for the time being that your principal component one actually gave you a number that corresponded to either zero if you're European Asian or European white, uh, you know, one if you're 100% East Asian and some value between zero and one if you're mixed, then you could actually use that as part of your line fitting procedure because you could build the in kind of two models, one where you correct for just, one where you fit just age, gender, and now your PC coordinate instead of, you know, ethnicity, and another model where you fit both SNP, age, gender, and PC, and then you could compare the two models, just like we talked about before, to figure out if your SNPs are predictive even after you consider age, gender, and now PC, where PC is now your surrogate for ethnicity. And so here's an example of an actual principal components figure that you might actually get from a real GWAS cohort. And so this was uh, a figure published from one of the earliest GWAS studies uh, done in modern times. And so uh, in this particular study, uh, a number of individuals from Europe uh, were sequenced or genotyped. And because we knew their country of origin and we also genotype them. Basically what these authors did is they could draw a PC plot where they computed a similarity matrix, they ran PC, they got the principal component one and two for each individual, and then they just drew a scatter plot where each point represents an individual and the point, each point is colored by the country of origin that we knew ahead of time uh, when the study was done. And the point of this figure here is that you can see that um, the basically points of the same points of the same country cluster together on this map. And what that means is that in principal component space, people that were genotyped from the same country have very similar uh, SNPs overall. And furthermore, uh, so basically the point here is that even though this principal components analysis statistical technique didn't know about the country of origin, right? You only gave it this genetic similarity matrix as input. The PCs that it spat out, in particular PC1 and PC2, give you coordinates that somehow closely resemble, or they somehow group together individuals from the same country. And so the point here is that by using PC1 and PC2 as variables in your uh, linear model, you're essentially correcting for country of origin, even if you didn't know it ahead of time when you did the when you did the uh, genotyping. Um, and another little sort of fun observation is that if you kind of squint closely uh, on this diagram, you can see that uh, the position of individuals from different countries kind of correspond loosely to their actual geographic map position of the country. Um, this doesn't always happen, but uh, you know, this can sometimes happen if you get lucky. And so here's a plot which basically shows you on, again, kind of a real GWAS study, what happens when you don't correct for any population structure, which is, again, kind of the QQ plot uh, represented by the black line. And here you get a bunch of lines corresponding to, for example, the red line. The red line is what you get if you correct for, for example, the first two principal components on the same study. And so you can see that by correcting for a country of origin, um, you basically uh, your QQ plot tells you that your uh, p-values become less and less inflated. So inflated means that you see a lot more signal than you expect. And so by bringing the black line to the red line, you basically um, lose a lot of the inflation that you saw before. Um, what do you see also on this plot, hopefully is an orange line. And the orange line corresponds to um, basically what happens if you use what I called before a linear mixed model. Um, and so the orange line is a little bit hard to see on this diagram, um, but basically the, the mixed model would actually give you an, a line that's even closer to the, to the diagonal than the PC corrected uh, line. And so this is just to show you that, um, yeah, linear mixed models tend to be a <clears throat> even better way of correcting for 
uh, genetic similarity matrix effects, um, but we won't go over what they are here in this class. So here I just want to make a quick point again about the multiple hypothesis testing problem. So again, just like we saw previously, uh, when you're performing many statistical tests, your chances of uh, false positives runs higher. And so you have to do some kind of p-value correction in order to address the fact that you tested multiple SNPs. Um, one thing to note is that because of linkage disequilibrium, even when you test 10 million SNPs, not all of them are independent because SNPs can be highly correlated because they get co-inherited. And so actually estimating the number of independent tests that you're doing, which then helps you do p-value correction, is actually not trivial because many SNPs are just kind of partially correlated with each other. And so calculating the number of independent tests that you did is, is not trivial, but more or less what the field of human genetics anyways has come to conclude is that uh, when you do genome-wide association studies, even if you test millions of SNPs, generally speaking, uh, people think that there's about, you should correct for the fact that about a million independent SNPs have been tested for. Um, and so uh, I think for ease of calculation's sake, oftentimes people use a Bonferroni uh, style of p-value correction. And so what that means is that um, when people look for statistical significance in their GWAS SNPs, they look for a p-value, an effective nominal p-value threshold of five times 10 to the negative eight, which is what you expect if you took a nominal p-value of 0 0.05 and you divide by a million. So a really important point to make is that even the best conducted studies can still have hidden confounders that are just really hard to identify and correct for, especially when it comes to things like uh, distantly related individuals in a study that bias your results or a uh, certain ethnic or population structure that you can't completely get rid of with principal components or linear mixed models. It's generally not a great idea to believe associations or chase associations that are only reported by one study. Um, and this is true regardless of whether or not you see genome-wide statistical significance. Um, and so generally speaking, uh, the bar for seeing an association that you want to follow up on should be that you see replication in at least you know, one other or two other studies. Um, it's just, it's too easy for there to be false positive associations that are not real in GWAS studies.